this is a really interesting period in, in history that I'm engaging with at the moment. This is broadly what they call Impressionism. Um, Impressionism began towards the end of the 19th century and into the first half of the 20th century. Um, and why did it come about? And I guess what's it got to do with visual communication? Well, music and art, uh, painting, um, text, and more recently film have always had a relationship that goes back and forth. And why did it start? Well, really it, it came towards the end of the 19th century when artists and thinkers from all over the world really started to to challenge existing ideas, whether it was about religion or whether it was about science. Um, they really started to explore the idea that art forms overlapped and things could merge and meld into each other. Um, and that happened from America through to Russia, all, all the way around the world. This new form of thinking about what art was and how it related to other art forms so what happened in France in particular was we had the development of this new style of painting called Impressionism. And it was coined Impressionism by an art critic after a particular exhibition in the latter part of the 1880s. And it was deliberately associated with a work by um, Monet called Sunrise. And if you look at that painting, you'll see that we get impressions of things. We get obviously water. We get the sun, we get uh, boats and we can kind of see factories or buildings, but nothing's clear. There are no clear lines, short brush strokes, lots of use of light and, and colour. And then along comes this composer called Debussy, Claude Debussy, uh, born 1862. So he lived most of his life in the 19th century, but through to 1918. And he revolutionised what we call Western art music of the time because he developed a unique style um, and it became known as impressionistic music, even though he disliked the term because he, like many artists, didn't like being pigeonholed into a particular box. But nevertheless, he constructed a new sound um, called impressionism in music. Where did he get these ideas from? Well, as I talked about a little earlier, W.C. straight away wanted to move out of the confines of Romanticism. Uh, and one of the first things that happened was while he was a student at the very famous Paris Conservatory, he won a prize, the Prix de Rome, and that prize entitled for him to go and study and work at the Villa Medici in Rome, famous uh, institution to this day. And while he was there, he met famous sculptors. Um, he read Shakespeare voraciously. He collaborated with painters. For example, one was John Whistler. And we can see the influence of Debussy's sound and music in some of the paintings of John Whistler. Um, and so there were opportunities while he was there to work with different artists to learn, to look at new shapes and new colours and that sort of thing. So over this time, he started to construct this new sound. Um, and it really was meant to create new images or impressions um, in the listener or the viewer, if you like. So he really became a master at this. Um, he did eventually influence other uh, composers and impressionism in music spread to other countries. Um, to America, to England, uh, Italy even. Uh, but in terms of an icon in that period of time and an icon in terms of a new form of musical language, which really was music as painting, um, Claude Debussy was that person. So normally when we talk about music, the word lines doesn't often come up. We tend to talk about shapes and structures and that sort of thing. Um, but what Debussy did very successfully was blur the lines. Now, if I play you a very short example of something that's very clear to the ears, easy to follow and based on lines, it's a famous work by Bach and you're, I'm sure you will have heard it. <laughs> So 
So very clear, we can feel the pulse. So we can feel a rhythm, which is a structure. We can feel the pulse, we can hear every single note, and there's a relationship between all the notes that works in lines. But what Debussy did was he came along, um, he was strongly influenced, as I've talked about, by impressionist painters and the way that they blurred lines using short dab strokes and colours and light and shade. And he used a couple of devices in particular. Um, well, three really stand out and two of them in particular come from Asian music. And he was exposed to Asian music at a world exhibition in Paris in the late uh, late 19th century. And one of the most uh, well-known Asian devices musically is what they call the pentatonic scale. It's a five note scale. So it's very easy to create Asian sound and music just using those five notes. And that device was frequently built into his music as a way of moving away from what we call traditional tonalities. Another one he used was what's called the whole tone scale, which is made up of tones only. Um, so an equal division between each of the notes in the scale. And that's, it sounds like this. So it's got a very dreamlike quality, particularly if you use what we call the sustaining pedal, which uh, damp, which lets the sound resonate even more, so you can imagine. You get that sense of wash, of colour, of um, sort of transience in time, because it, there's no sort of start and end. Um, to illustrate that further, if I play your traditional major scale, it's designed in a way, a pattern of semitones and tones to have a start, and a finish. We change that to the whole tone scale, all of a sudden it just goes on. You could stop it anywhere and you wouldn't know if it was continuing or going back and forwards and that sort of thing. The other device he used, and it came again from the inspiration of Asian music, and in this case it was the gamelan ensemble, which is an Indonesian ensemble, bells and chimes, and you hear bells and chimes in DPC all the time, simple things like... So we, lots and lots of bell sounds. So the outsides here, we've got deep bells and high bells. And he used them a lot. Bells. And they're a feature of his music as well. Um, so a very strong influence of Asian music. We've talked about the influence of the Impressionist composers. Now what I can start explaining is give you some real examples of, of how he paints with Impressionism but using sound. And the first example I'll give you is a very, very famous piece by WC called Claire de Lune, um, all about moonlight. And if we just listen to the opening few bars of this, you'll, you'll hear firstly that there's no real sense of rhythm where it's going. It's very relaxed, it's free. And there's some very rich harmonic changes and sounds. You'll hear bells, you'll hear dreamlike, you'll hear um, almost watery in nature. So it could be that it's the moon above water. Thank 
But you'll, here's another really classic example of these rich harmonies that sort of are blurring the lines. He deliberately says use rubato, which means be very flexible in the rhythm and the way it's presented. But we'll hear bells, almost bell-like sound. <laughs> It's got this richness in it, it's got colour and light. Um, and the interesting thing about Debussy is he never wrote what's called program music, so you can't actually follow a script. So he doesn't tell you that, okay, a moon starts to emerge from the clouds, here it's at its peak, here it's fading away, um, here it's being covered by a dark cloud. It's all left deliberately vague and unclear like the entire nature of Impressionist art. It's up to the listener, and in this case me, as the interpreter of his sound, to, to link it to what I believe he might be trying to give an impression of. So that's one of the really famous um, pieces, and you'll hear that in movies lots, you'll hear that all over the place, um, weddings even, it's such a beautiful sound. Moving on now to talk a little bit about some of his very influential works. They're called Piano Preludes. Now, he wrote two books of them um, during his lifetime, and they really are regarded as classic cornerstones of him, not only Impressionist music, but this blending of the art forms. And I'm going to play you little bits of what's called, and this is the other thing, the interesting thing about what he did was the title of each of the preludes is not at the beginning of the work, it comes at the very end. And that's a deliberate move by Debussy to say, I'm not going to tell you exactly what it's about until you finish. Um, so let me play you a very short um, couple of lines and then I'll explain to you the title of the work and then how I've interpreted these musical elements. So it'd be a little bit difficult if you don't know the piece and you're listening for the first time to really get a sense of what, what he's writing about. The end of the work, he writes sails or veils. So we're talking breath, we're talking wind. I interpret this to be more about sails and water than, than um, just veils. But to me, what we're hearing here, and... Um, and I will also highlight now that here's the whole tone scale beautifully. That's the whole tone scale all over it. So to me, this is this opening figure is the sail gently moving, and then maybe a seagull. Then we have the sail again. gently swaying perhaps could be a wave a gentle wave back comes a sail just heard then is another feature of his music is this amazing ability to create layers and textures which is a feature of of all the visual arts as well looking at depth and perception and layers and textures so by the time we get to line three we've got water down the bottom we've got our boat in the middle and we've got our sail on top so putting those three together boat 
Rosa, Sile. incredibly clever way of creating blurred lines and textures um, to give the impression of the things that we associate with water and, and wind and sails. And if you, th if you again think of that Monet painting, surely there's some influence of that here. Um, I'll also briefly show you the incredible way he would create a wash of sound. And again, we're, we're in the work sails. And this time it's using the pentatonic scale. You remember this one? So as the music's coming to these, these moments, we'll hear this incredible wash of sound and it's created using the pentatonic scale. there is incredible um, and the way he's able to use a very simple five note device and the texture of the keyboard to create or to give the impression of what clearly is either a big gust of wind or it could be you know a freak wave but again listen to just that richness and the sonorous nature of what he's been able to create Fascinating. Um, moving on to give you a further example. Um, again, this time I'm not going to tell you the title of the piece until I've played a little bit of it. Um, but let's listen to a few short moments of it. It's a bleak sound, it's, a, it's almost a dark sound. The title is Footprints in the Snow. So to me, this is obviously the person walking. Step, step, another step. And then perhaps this is a memory or a vision or or the thinking or the reflecting about loss, which I hear in this. You can almost feel the pain in this person's heart. And again, remember Impressionism is about giving an impression. It could, it could be that it's an animal. It may not be a human being in the snow. It could be a fawn um, or a tiny animal with their tiny footprints. And that was, that was the intent of Debussy's work, was not to give you clear understandings. It was to make you imagine, to view things differently, to be challenged about how, in this case, sounds might influence your visual perception. Um, and so that's how he, he used music as a form of painting, really. It's an oral sound, yes, but it paints in your mind visions and pictures. Um, this time to something a little brighter. And you'll hear a very wandering, sunny sound is, is I guess, what I'm hearing here. title of this, once again found at the very end, is The Girl with the Flaxen Hair, or The Girl with the Blonde Hair. 
So when we know that now, one thinks, or I think, something like, well, playful. And comfortable. Obviously, maybe in a meadow, um, but she's happy. Maybe remembering lovely things from her childhood. So we've gone from, in the previous example, that real sense of bleakness and almost darkness from footprints in the snow to now sunshine and warmth. Um, and so imagine that girl with the flaxen hair. Uh, what is she doing? Where is she? What is she thinking? What is she dreaming about, perhaps? Um, now we'll move on to uh, something a little bit different. Um, and again, I'll play you something. Okay, might resonate for some of you, but it's very much got this the influence of guitar, and in this case, the title of the work is The Interrupted Serenade. To me, it sounds very Spanish. Very much, this is a guitarist plucking away. Um, but what happens in this work is he constantly gets interrupted. So, so he's happily playing away. And then he starts to... And now he's interrupted and he's changing. over the top. Back to another form of guitar playing. And there's the big interruption. So Debussy throws in this massive interruption. Now again, let your imagination run wild. It could be you got this guitarist sitting in this beautiful courtyard in the middle of Spain and somebody throws a load of washing over the balcony or drops a plate or or there's a there's a scuffle in the street or whatever it is um, but again it, it's an impression we don't know for sure what he was thinking um, if he was thinking clearly about what that was meant to represent at all um, and that's the beauty of the music last example I'll play you a little bit about one of his very famous pieces it's called I'll give you the name this time because you've already heard a little bit of it, The Sunken Cathedral. And it's based on a legend um, of a famous cathedral that once a year comes out of the water off the coast of France. Um, uh, various artists, impressionist artists, painted scores of different um, cathedrals. Um, so Debussy clearly saw a lot of these artworks. And in this case, he um, created his own impression of this legend of this cathedral coming out of the water. As I played before, we've got bells. Cathedrals have those wonderful, beautiful bell sounds. So, and in the middle, maybe a slightly wa slightly rising wave as the music rises. So the wave comes up and slowly falls. Another slight wave. Up and then it resides again. And each time that we're slowly sinking, so we're starting here. Listen to the bass, it gets lower, lower again, lower again. So each time I think the impression is the cathedral is possibly just sinking a little bit further. Pretty soon into it. for the bells, there's lots of them. So constantly those bell sounds in this part. Then we go to perhaps a little bit more of a, a larger wave. So the wave
players start to build up and again they start to change, more active. Up and down, we're getting bells, um, typical Debussy. And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where we start to see the cathedral emerge and that's where it's at its brightest and its strongest. starts to sink again. So again, we're falling back down into the water. Lower and lower. Then we hear the sound of monks chanting. aspects of a, of a very traditional, grandiose cathedral. Um, once again we, we hear water in a very simple device here. You can almost feel it, smell it, taste it almost. A memory of the cathedral perhaps. But it's definitely back in the water. Typical WC, we finish with bells. High bells, medium bells, low bells. So some, some excerpts, some examples of the way he used musical devices as a form of painting. Um, as I've said all along, Impressionism was about stimulating the senses. It was about encouraging the viewer, the listener in this case, to see things, to feel things and to even smell things. Um, and he certainly was a master at it. Musically, what Debussy did was really focus on blurring the lines. Now, Previously, structures were clear, forms were clear, easy to understand, and music was built on quite clear patterns. Um, but he was really about throwing all that away and almost in some ways doing the opposite. And there's a great quote from Debussy himself that really helps us understand what his goals and ideals were. Um, open quote, there is no theory, you only have to listen. Pleasure is the law. I love music passionately, and because I love it, I try to free it from the barren traditions that stifle it. It is a free art gushing forth, an open air boundless as the elements, the wind, the sky, the sea. It must never be shut in and become an academic art." End quote. Isn't it amazing, even just in his choice of words, he, he refers to the wind, the sea, um, the elements, the senses, um, about being passionate, about pleasure. And that really was a feature of art at the time. Um, it was about pleasing the senses, whether visual, oral, and as I talked about, even the emotions. So music does have a strong relationship to visual communication in that there's a historical relationship there, and we can see how in the case of WC, he was inspired by visual art in particular, but also by the great symbolist poets. Um, shapes and structures and lines had previously found their way into music and art and vice versa. 
But what Debussy did was he focused on inspiring visions and memories, colours, even smells. Um, he was the master at inspiring the other senses. So, and in particular, uh, our capacity to see and to visualise through sound. One of Debussy's most famous works, and again, it's frequently uh, built into movie scenes, um, or used as soundtracks in other forms, is Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn. And if you listen to the opening flute line, you'll get this sense of wandering, of, of nostalgia almost. You don't really know where it's going and that sort of thing. And it's a great, uh, it's a great way to again illustrate what the Impressionists were doing. Now, Debussy was inspired by the the poem Afternoon of a Fawn by the French symbolist poet Mallarmé. And Mallarmé was a mentor to Debussy and obviously they socialised, they talked, they worked together. So there's this clear influence here. And if I'll read to you a brief excerpt of the poem itself that gives you an idea of just how, how rich uh, the colour and the visuals are that are being suggested or, or proposed by Mallarmé and which Debussy then used to influence his sounds. Let us reflect, or if the woman that you are glossing, figure a wish of your fabulous senses. Fawn, the illusion escapes of the eyes, blue and cold, like a weeping spring of the more chaste one. But the other all sighs, would you say that she contrasts? like a hot breeze of the day into your fleece? Ah no, out of the immobile and weary swoon, suffocating with warmth and cold morning if it struggles. Murmurs no water save, my flute pours. Into the thicket sprinkled with cords and the only wind, except for the two pipes quick to exhale before. It disperses the sound into a dry rain. It is at the horizon, not rippled or not stirred. The visible and serene artificial breath of inspiration which regains the sky. Obviously that was an English version of the original, which is French. Um, the French language has a, has a very colourful nature to it as it is, very sensual. You know, we often talk about the French language as being one of the sexiest languages in the world. Um, now have a listen to that same text but spoken in French and I think you will hear some differences in terms of sensuality and how it inspires or influences your own senses. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful sound um, and it will give you an additional understanding of what these poets were trying to do in the way that they used sound through language. Réfléchissant Où si les femmes dont tu glosses Figure un souhait de tes sens fabuleux. Faune, l'illusion s'échappe des yeux bleus et froid comme une sorte sans pleurs de la plus chaste. Mais l'autre, tout soupir, dis-tu quel contraste comme brise du jour chaude dans ta toison Que non, pas l'immeuble et laisse pas moison. Suffocant de chaleur, le matin frais s'il lutte. Ne me meurs point d'eau que ne verse ma flûte Au bosquet arrosé d'accord Et le seul vent hors des deux tuyaux Prend à s'exhaler avant Qu'il disperse le son dans une pluie aride C'est à l'horizon par remué d'un ride Le visible et serein souffle Artificiel de l'inspiration qui regarde le ciel. Listening to that text in English, it, we see all the characteristic words of Impressionist, all the symbolist parts, but also Impressionism. Blue, cold, spring, um, hot breeze, swoon, murmurs, water, sprinkled, wind and rain. Um, they're all words that inspire our senses, that challenge our senses, that make us think, what am I seeing, what am I feeling, what am I smelling? Um, and really, 
Debussy's work that he wrote in response to this poem is an amazing example of how he achieved that through music. So just to wrap up this little discussion of, of one of his most famous works and what it was inspired by and what, it, what he set out to do with his sound, there's a very famous letter that he wrote to a, a French critic um, specifically or making it very clear to the critic that the idea of his music was not to be an exact copy of the poem or a word for word or music for word translation but to give an impression and these are Debussy's words. It is the general impression of the poem, because in following it more closely, music would run out of breath as if a dray horse were competing for the Grand Prix with a thoroughbred. Again, symbolist language, breath, general impression, dray horse competing with a thoroughbred. So once again, it really illustrates his way of composing, which was not to create replicas or copies or to try and turn paintings into music sound by sound, but to use his language as a way of giving you an impression of what was meant to be seen, heard or felt. So we come back to the issue of, or the question really, of, of how does music uh, become or relate to visual communication. We've talked about the fact that there's been a relationship between music and art uh, for centuries now, but it certainly came to a really key point in history at the end of the 19th and first part of the 20th where artists, thinkers, commentators, writers, critics all really started to get excited and embrace this concept of the melding of the senses or how art forms could move between the other and influence the other and thus create a richer, stronger sensory perception. Um, we've talked about Debussy's part in that. But there have been many other artists um, that have worked very closely with, um, with musicians. Um, and what we're also sort of heading towards here is this concept of synesthesia, where um, an overload, if you like, or a challenging of the senses. So, for example, you might listen to some sounds and see a particular colour. Um, you might feel that you can taste the colour red. Um, or another example is that you might be viewing something and hear a certain set of sounds or, or music. And that, that concept really came to, uh, came to life during that time, where whether it was painters or composers or writers, we've talked about poets too, they really set out to challenge the senses to create a richer sensory experience. Um, and to leave a certain sense of resonance in the, in the body or the mind or the eyes or the ears. Um, various other strong relationships between artists and music have existed in history. Um, the artist Paul Klee came up with works that featured musical structures, polyphony, motifs, uh, and several of his works feature those elements in his, in his paintings in particular. Oscar Fischinger was also influenced um, strongly by music and he set out in some of his works to really paint music, but in this case through, through animated film or short film. Um, another very strong relationship in, in art and music history is that between Kandinsky and Schoenberg. Schoenberg was groundbreaking in that he completely threw out what we refer to as tonality, which is the traditional system of, of sound that had been used for centuries and he created a free chromatic form in his music. Um, very advanced, very uh, contemporary and Kandinsky was heavily inspired by this and so in many of his works, particularly his composition series, you can see this free freedom, this free chromaticism. Not impressionist but very free in its form, 
lots of freedom in structure and colour and lines and that sort of thing. When discussing music, Kandinsky had this to say. Colour is the keyboard, the eyes are the harmonies. The soul is the piano with many strings. The artist is the hand that plays, touching one key than another to cause vibration in the soul. So again, another example of, of painters and musicians that have inspired each other and worked with each other. Um, when you think visual communication, you normally think an image, a still image, a picture, a painting, um, but more recently with the growth in film, films are, are an enormous part of our life. When you look at a picture, uh, let's take a family picture, you might remember a certain smell, uh, whether it was at the beach when you grew up having family picnics. If there was a particular painting in your lounge room on the wall or at grandma or granddad's house, you might remember the smell of the dust in their room or their carpet. Um, you might have a particular emotional response to a, a still image work. Um, again, as a result of an experience. It could have been a good experience, it may have been a bad experience. So, if you have had a bad experience, say being lost in the forest or struggling to swim in the water, when you see water you may feel fear. So this is this idea of blending of the senses, um, which these artists really set out to do. Another great thing to think about and another example is, next time you're watching uh, a great movie, um, try a scary movie or a tense movie, turn the sound down and you'll really understand how the power of the visuals is reduced when that sound is taken away. So music has the capacity to really influence the impact that visuals can have on us as viewers. So what I encourage you to do next time you look at images, whether they're still images or you look at film, um, ask yourself, what am I seeing? What am I feeling? Um, what sort of memories come to mind? How do I feel emotionally? Do I feel happy, upset? in between, none of those. The whole point is to really ask yourself, well, when I see things, uh, what's happening to my eyes, my ears, and even my smells and my tastes. And that really is the key message of how music and visual communication comes together and has an impact on us as people. All of this relates back to Debussy in the sense that he broke new ground in blending senses, in blurring the lines and in encouraging us to really think about well, what are we hearing, what are we seeing and what are we understanding when we look at art and we hear art.